We're ready to continue with our program. We have uh, four international guests today with us, and they'll be speaking today, tomorrow, and on Wednesday. And our first guest today is Dr. Carla Costa. She was born in Angola and uh, later on moved to Portugal, where she spent most of her life and currently lives in Maastricht, Netherlands, where she's an assistant professor at the University of Maastricht. Dr. Costa specializes in development of technology-based companies and has played an important role in development of biotech industry in Portugal. Dr. Costa received her doctorate from uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with a specialty in technological change. And she's very glad to be back here in the United States with us today because it hasn't been that long. Was it a year? Oh, about many, many years. Many, many years. Okay. No, no, many, many years. <laughs> Without further delay, I present to you Dr. Carla Costa. by thanking uh, the, the college for inviting me to be here and uh, great uh, president uh, Bonnie and her wonderful team. I've been uh, spending a few days already here and I've been able to uh, witness how committed they are to uh, giving you guys a good education and how they're really struggling to make this uh, significant for your lives, not only for just the years you spend here, but that you learn something that's going to be significant in your whole life. So I'm really happy to be here and try and contribute as well. And I would also like to thank the Master Institute for Entrepreneurship for inviting me to be here. And uh, Dr. Benoit is no longer here right now, but I'd like to thank him publicly for uh, inviting me and uh, taking the faith that I would do a good job. <laughs> they never saw me present before, so uh, uh, I hope I don't uh, mess it up. <laughs> so, um, I'm Carla. I was born in Rachel, as Melinda said, and I would like to start, this is a little feedback? Yeah. I'd like to start by introducing myself a little bit more and try to explain why I'm here and why I'm trying to talk to you guys about entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship, as I said before, as I said before, is my topic of work. I think it's too much feedback. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, maybe I go this way. So, uh, I'm an academic. I don't know if I should apologize for that, but I'm an academic. I, I'm a professor. I do research, so that's my job. I, I'm really passionate about learning, about finding out more about the world, about understanding human behavior, and about understanding how that human behavior has an impact in uh, economy, in society, and, uh, and that's why I study entrepreneurship. But the real reason why I'm interested in entrepreneurship is because I've seen it. I've seen it from really close, and I've seen the sparkle in the eyes of entrepreneurs when they're out there trying to build their dreams, and trying to get their companies to go from the ground, go from an idea they have in their heads, into actually seeing it at work, seeing people buying their products. And I've seen it. I've seen how passionate they are and how amazing these people are. It's really a privilege to work with entrepreneurs and to see how they are building their dreams, really. And uh, so if you've seen that, uh, it's really, uh, I think it's really passionate, it's really interesting to work with these people. And this is why also, uh, before I started uh, becoming, uh, before I became an, an academic and before I became an, a researcher and a professor of entrepreneurship, I had this experience for many years to help the entrepreneurs uh, develop their ideas. And this is why I decided to actually go into research about entrepreneurship, because I really find it fascinating. And if you're going to do something, you better do something about something that really finds uh, that you really find uh, interesting and passion. And so I think this is the explanation to why I'm here today and to why I'm talking about entrepreneurship. Although I'm not an entrepreneur myself, I really find it very interesting, and I always want to learn more about entrepreneurship and how people do it. 
So, but this is just about me, just to make you understand why I'm standing right here and talking to you about entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about it, although I'm not really practicing it myself. So, enough about me. Uh, oh no, there's something else about me that I'd like to talk to you guys about. It's actually a challenge that I'd like to leave for you guys. And I would really be looking forward to see if you guys are going to be taking this one. Um, one of the things that I've done while working with entrepreneurs, and actually was at the same time as I was doing my PhD, was that I became organizer of something called Startup Pirates. And uh, so uh, it was a, a ton of fun. It was a lot of hard work. This is just an event for entrepreneurs. But it's an event that was um, started by a group of crazy people in Portugal. And it's now going to India. It's going to Brazil. It's all over Europe. and. Uh, yeah, a lot of places. And what you do is you have, get a, gather a team of people and you just uh, organize an event. You have a lot of support from the main team in Portugal and uh, you can do this yourselves. You just gather a group of people who are uh, interested in entrepreneurship, who want to create an event. And I can tell you this for me was a really great learning experience. It was a lot of hard work as well. But it was uh, really a big privilege. I learned a lot and I, I know that I made a difference in people's lives because when they were able to uh, participate in this program, a lot of them told us that they changed their lives because it, they became more uh, empowered to become entrepreneurs. And so I was uh, looking forward to see if any of you would be willing or in interested to also become a, an organizing team for Startup Pirates. And you would not be doing this by yourself because there's a lot of support from the organizing team, uh, the original team. So uh, if you want to talk about this later on, let me know. I would also be willing to help. But I just wanted to leave you, this, you guys with this challenge and see if anybody is brave enough to try to do it as well. So now enough about me and what am I going to talk about? So as you saw before, I'm an academic, but I also really like the practical side of entrepreneurship. I really like to see entrepreneurs uh, building their companies. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to talk about theory, and I'm going to talk about action. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you or share with you guys a few things that we've learned from research about entrepreneurs and about entrepreneurship. But I'm also going to show you a few examples, practical examples, and I'm going to show you that if you really want to, you guys can actually do it. This is not something for somebody else or from some privileged people. This is something that you can also do. It's in your hands. So I'll show you a few examples. But first, let's start what, with a little, some words about uh, entrepreneurship or theory of entrepreneurship. Uh, one of the first things I'd like to say is that uh, the concept of entrepreneurship uh, has been a while, uh, a lot, um, it's been there for a while. But one of my main references or one of the main uh, people that I really think were able to nail it and really describe what entrepreneurship is, is Schumpeter. And if you look at it, he did this work or his research, his writing, in 1934. That was a long time ago, but I really think his work as an economist uh, was uh, very important and I think he was one of the ones who could really explain entrepreneurship better. And he really was the one who pointed out how entrepreneurs really have a very important role in our society. So what does he say? He says that entrepreneurs are people who actually are able to bring change. So they're doing things in a different way and they're, doing, uh, they're bringing in innovation. So they're not just copying what their neighbor's doing, they're not just opening another restaurant or another cafe, just like everybody else. They're trying to change something. They want to do something different from what everybody else has done. So they are daring to bring some change and innovation on the table. Uh, they really need to do something different. And it's not innovation just in technological change. It's not just bringing a new technology. It could be uh, uh, innovation in, in business terms. So if you could bring, of course, a new product, a new technology, but also you could be doing a new method of production that really, for example, cuts down the cost to have or does some dramatic change where there's no pollution or anything else that really changes and has a significant impact on the way you produce something. Or you could just be 
taking something into a completely new market that is very, very different from what the, was there before. You can, for example, find a new source of supply for a new for your product, or you could just organize your, your company in a completely different way. For example, you will just instead of uh, using the traditional way people people uh, find to, to sell or organize the company, you can just do it in a completely new way, and that might as well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, and that might as well be very innovative and make you very, very uh, competitive in a market. So it's not all about technology, although technology may play an important role, but it could be that you are innovating in business ways, so you're introducing new ways of doing your, what you're doing, and you're doing it better. Uh, at least that's the idea, that you do it better. <laughs> and so uh, for me and for most scholars, Entrepreneurship is really about bringing innovation. So it's very, uh, it's really needs to be related to innovation. If you're not doing anything new, you maybe you have your own company, uh, but it's really not that entrepreneurial. You're not really daring to do anything different. The thing about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is that you are really trying to make your own statement. You want to do things your way, not let people tell you to do it but the way you really think it should be done. And this is very uh, personal to the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is the one who is looking for autonomy, so he wants to do things uh, his way, and he's looking also for his independence. He doesn't want to have somebody else telling him what to do. And this is uh, very typical of entrepreneurs. They want to build their own dream. They don't want to work for somebody else's dream. And this is why you see that they are uh, so happy to get out of bed in the morning and go to work because they really are building their own dream. And if you think about it, it's a question you, when you make your career decisions, you have the option to wake up every day very happy and go to work and figure out fine ways to make your boss a lot wealthier. Or <laughs> you can, uh, you know, try to build your own dream and also try to think about how to make yourself wealthier. It, it's not always that it means that the entrepreneur will become a very rich person. Of course, that's the idea. But it's uh, sometimes more important for the entrepreneur that he is building his own dream and not so much that he's going to get really, really rich, but that he's doing things his way. He's going to see change in the world that was brought by him. You know, you're going to see people using your products, you're going to see people changing in society because of the things that you've done. You will see a big impact of your life and of your action. And this is sometimes uh, uh, also a very strong motivation for the entrepreneurs that they really want to build their dream and that they want to have an impact in society. And so this is what is uh, special and thrilling also about entrepreneurs. It's already my personal opinion. So, uh, However, entrepreneurship is really not a very consensual uh, uh, definition of entrepreneurship. And there's a lot of different uh, subjects or topics uh, that are disciplines that have been uh, studying entrepreneurship, from psychology to a lot of uh, sociology, anthropology. So it's a very complex topic, and everyone has a different, little different perspective. Uh, so there's not a lot of consensus. But uh, there's a lot of research about how uh, entrepreneurial process goes. And also there's a lot of information about how individual characteristics may influence the likelihood that you become an entrepreneur. There's also the influence of the culture of the country. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There's the influence of the institutions, and this is the way the society is organized. There's also a lot of research about how you can be an employee and also be a sort of an entrepreneur just by being an, what they call an entrepreneur. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of uh, great examples of entrepreneurs. I'm going to put a few here on the, on the board and maybe you can tell me who these people are. Does anybody know who these people are? Their names? Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. Richard Branson. Richard Branson. Richard Branson. Sam And Chen Wang, I guess, from Bruce, if you will not know her. But I wanted to use also a woman entrepreneur. So, because there's there are a lot of women entrepreneurs as well. And this is Chen Wang. She's uh, the co-founder of HTC in Taiwan. 
So maybe she's a little bit further away, so maybe you don't know her as well. Uh, but these are people that we all see in the media. We see them on TV all the time. Everybody knows who they are. There's movies about them. So they become some sort of heroes. Uh, these people are modern heroes. They are the people you, we all would like to become. And, and this is good and bad. It's good because it gives you a good example, it gives you role models, people you can look up to, people you can learn from. But the bad side is that they become such celebrities and such, uh, you know, they're like high in a pedestal. So it, it seems like you cannot reach them, you cannot be like them because they are such superhuman human people. And, uh, and so a lot of people have this portrait of an entrepreneur like a superhuman person. And it does take a lot of strength and good skills, but it's not like you cannot do it as well. And uh, what I try to do here today is to show you that you can also become an entrepreneur, you can also be very successful. And uh, it's really in your hands. It's about uh, you wanting to do this uh, and you having the willpower to really achieve what you want. So this is not something for specific special people. This is something you could also consider for yourselves to become an entrepreneur. And uh, over the course of the week, I think you will meet a few entrepreneurs as well. And you will see that they're, although they're great, they're also human. They're normal people. <laughs> no? OK. <laughs> So what I would like to try to convince you guys is that you can also become entrepreneurs if you really have the will to do so. Uh, but another question is why really? Why should we care about entrepreneurship? Why is it important at all? Why should we care? Is it just because it's, it looks good on your, you know, to say that you're an entrepreneur? No, really, uh, research has shown that entrepreneurship has a really strong impact in society and in, in the economy. Schumpeter actually described it as the motor of capitalism. And he talked about creative destruction. So how you create new things that will take over the place of old things and so renovate the economy, renovate the, the way things work, and bring change and innovation that we talked before. Also, research has shown that entrepreneurship really has a strong impact on regional development. And that's also part of what I'm doing research on the impact of entrepreneurship on the development of a region. And it has been shown that it also has a strong impact. Of course, obviously, it creates a lot of jobs. Uh, and that's also very good for any economy. And it re revitalizes the economic tissue and uh, the way the industries are organized. But however, a lot of people also say, this is just a hype. Come on, this is entrepreneurs. It's just because it's cool. It's really not uh, that impactful. Uh, but I would argue against it. I know that it, there is some, some sort of a hype in some places it's already a little bit too much. But it, the truth is that uh, entrepreneurship does have a strong impact in any economy. And this is why at least I think that we should care about entrepreneurship. Or at least it's why I care about entrepreneurship. Uh, I would like to like also talk about a few things that are, I'm not going to tell you everything about entrepreneurship, but I'm going to try to say a few things about things that I find really important about entrepreneurship. And some uh, of the research results that have been out there for a while say that, for example, the culture of the country really plays a strong uh, role in understanding how there is a, a bigger or a lower trend for people to become entrepreneurs in a country. And so I have really good news for you guys. The US has a really great, uh, I think you already know that, but US has a really great, um, sorry, oops. So this is the work by Hofstede. He's a researcher at the Maastricht University. And you cannot see it really well. Yeah, sorry, it doesn't show well. But this is the, what he found about the culture in the United States. And I don't think you can understand it all right now, but you can see that uh, the culture in the United States is really uh, very uh, supportive of entrepreneurship. You have a high individualism. People are really striving for themselves and trying to make their own living. So they're 
they're very uh, prone to try, go and try for themselves. And there's a lot more uh, other characteristics that you know that you can see there that are really supportive entrepreneurship. If you fail, it's also not like a big tragedy. If, and, and me and Europe are always like very jealous of how uh, the culture in the, in the US is much, much more supportive of entrepreneurship. So we think you guys are very lucky. So you should, should really feel privileged to be here and to have this uh, supportive culture that really can help you uh, become an entrepreneur and support you in that role. And so I, as we are always jealous of that, I think you should be aware that this is something you can take advantage of. And even if you're not from the US or if you're not gonna work here in the US, the fact that you've been here and that you've experienced this culture will never really disappear. Something that you've learned and you've experienced will, cannot really be unlearned. So I think your experience here and what you can learn from seeing how things can be done in a different way will affect how you can then uh, in, later in your life uh, do things and try to become an entrepreneur, for example. So let's just go back here. So another thing that I'd like to talk about is about having an idea or discovering an opportunity. And, and what, what research has also shown is that having a good idea or a good uh, business idea to start a company is not really just about the market uh, opportunity or the technology that there's out there. It's also about the entrepreneur. So there's some intersection between for example, the new technological developments or the new market opportunities, there's an intersection with that, with your own characteristics. How you, as an entrepreneur, bring something to the table. And so this is why we have this diagram here, where you show that, for example, your prior work experience and the knowledge that you have gained with that will really be very important in helping you identify opportunities that are really going to be making a difference. So if you have experience in one industry, if you felt uh, the problem or the situation where there's something to be solved, there's a problem that you could really identify, that really is usually a very strong uh, point when you go and, create and have an idea. So if you have experienced that pain, if you have felt it, you know that this is really a good business opportunity. So it's not just about how markets and technology evolve, it's also about what you bring to the table. And that is very, very also personal. It's about your experience, it's about your education, it's about also your network and things like that. And I also do some research about how, how your prior experience uh, has an effect on, on entrepreneurship and, and that's why I do some research on spin-offs. Something else that I think is interesting for you guys is when you think about starting a new business, uh, it's very automatic that people think about, well, yes, you have to have a business plan, of course. And I think it's even more uh, interesting when you have a uh, college education, you tend to be systematic. You tend to try to organize things and plan because this is what we've learned. And sometimes, uh, and so it's very natural that you try, of course, to build a business plan. And that's usually a very good idea. But if you're doing something that is completely disruptive, if you're trying to do something that nobody else ever tried, it's not like you're going to find a lot of uh, information out there or research that's going to tell you how, how big your market is, what your customers are going to be buying, you know, things like that. Nobody knows. There's a lot of uncertainty. And if you're doing something that's really, really new, it's really hard to plan. And if you're going to try to plan, it's definitely going to be way, way off. So a lot of people actually do their business plan because they have to like submit something to an investor or someone they would like to convince about the, how great their idea is. But in practical terms, the business plan might not be the best way to go about it. And so great research or very interesting research by Sarasvati has shown an alternative way of doing things uh, instead of sitting down at a desk, spending a month or two months or so working on a business plan there's an alternative way you could also start by doing things. 
which is, you know, crazy. Why would you start doing things instead of planning? But it, it is an alternative if you're really doing something very, very new. And so research has shown that some uh, entrepreneurs who are doing something really innovative uh, actually tend not to uh, become successful. They actually tend not to go about uh, writing a business plan, a, re a very rigid business plan from the beginning. They are going to go and try, experiment, start selling something, start learning from their market, start learning what the consumer needs. Of course, this is not just, I'm not saying you just go there and try and do it. This is a process that has, for example, they do, they do an analysis of what, what they can lose. What, what do you think I can lose? Uh, and it's okay, it will still be okay. So they call it affordable loss. So this is not going crazy about it, but you just have to, I just wanted you to think about that there are alternative ways. If you're doing something that is really, really innovative, it might be uh, wiser to start doing things in a careful way instead of planning it, uh, for it. <coughs> but of course, there's also uh, cases where the business plan is more uh, the best way to go about it. I just wanted to throw this on the table so that you know that. And then usually, entrepreneurs are always faced with a, a wall where they say, I have no money. <laughs> How am I going to start a new business? How am I going to implement my dreams if I have no money? Or they have some money, but not enough. But usually it takes a lot of money. And uh, so something else we discovered is that, of course, I think you've seen this before, probably. Uh, one of the first sources of financing that entrepreneurs use is the three Fs, which is family, friends, and fools. And uh, so <laughs> the, and this is very true. It sounds like a joke, but it's true. You first go to your family, you ask money from your parents or your rich uncle. Uh, and then you can also go to your friends and convince them how great your idea is. And they will also try to back you up. And you can also try to convince some fools. So just go around and try to convince people <coughs> how great your idea is. And if they're excited about how you talk to them, they might also even give you some money. Of course, there are other options. There are business angels, people who have uh, become successful in their businesses. They have a lot of money available. They would like to invest in good ideas, and they would also have a lot of experience and knowledge about it, so they would be giving you nice advice. But of course, they want, they want a piece of the cake, and they want to give you a small amount of money in a very early stage, and then you, your business idea will grow, and your company will become a lot bigger, and they have a, a big slice of a big thing instead of the small money that they gave you in the beginning. So it's also a good business for them. But if it's a good business angel, it can really help you out in the beginning. <coughs> of course, another technique that at least it's very popular in Europe, I don't know, here, I think here is also popular, is that entrepreneurs go for uh, competitions of entrepreneurship. They try to win money, real money, in uh, competitions that will also help them move one step in the right direction and become more and more of a, a compelling idea and a compelling business. Also, you can look for venture capital. It's like uh, a little, usually a little, bit, a little bit later when you already have, have uh, a lot of things on the table and you can convince them that you are a good investment. They will be willing to buy part of your shares, become your partners, and give you a lot of money for it. Uh, and lately, another option has been starting to get you used by entrepreneurs, which is crowdfunding, and I think my friends from the Netherlands will also talk about extensively about that because they have experienced it. So, but the idea is that you get people uh, to contribute with small amounts of money. So each person will contribute with a small amount of money, but since it's a big crowd, in the end it gets to an interesting amount of money. And so if these people can, for example, in some cases they will just buy your product in advance, for example, and you convince them that this is such a great product, they will pay in advance and you have money to work with, or they can just become uh, your partners as well. They will give you, for example, uh, $100 uh, or $200 or I don't know, and they will become uh, owning a small share in your company as well. And so instead of going for one big bank or one big investor, you can try to go for a large crowd of people for small amounts. So that's another option. And of course, since entrepreneurs are usually uh, 
have limited cash, even though they, there are all, the, all these sources, it's still uh, sometimes complicated. It's very common that entrepreneurs use a lot of bootstrapping. And bootstrapping, is, it's, it's, it has a strange name, but it's very simple. It's just trying to do with less money, you know. For example, instead of renting an office, you just work at home. Don't pay rent. It becomes less uh, a lower investment that you have to make. Or, for example, instead of buying a new equipment that is very expensive, you will just borrow somebody's equipment. <laughs> yes, it's, it sounds very obvious, but sometimes when you think, oh, I, have to, I need all this, how am I going to do it? I need a lot of money. But if you go around and find different ways of finding uh, the things that you need, the resources that you need, at a much lower cost, so these are examples of ways that you can do it. You can, for example, make sure your customers really pay on time or in advance, uh, instead of waiting for a few months that they will give you some their money. And you can also, for example, not uh, make a deal with your uh, suppliers that you're not going to pay immediately. So there's a lot of ways that you can try to stretch your money and make, for, make sure that you can go another mile with less money than before. So but these are just a uh, few things that I wanted to highlight from research on entrepreneurship. It's just some, uh, I guess, a little bit loose ideas, but I think it will give you an idea or an impression of what uh, research can do to help uh, with entrepreneurship. But uh, what I really would like to do is move on to show you a few examples of companies and examples of people who have done this and uh, that are, I think, a lot more interesting. So the first one, of course, I could talk about Nerdalize and about how uh, they are doing great and they're a great uh, group of people, but they're going to be here on stage uh, uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday to talk about themselves, so I think they'll do a much better job than I will. Oh, and you're going to bring me up? <laughs> Actually, I have one in my backpack as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about Sens Umbrellas. It's a Dutch company. I'm going to try to talk about Dutch companies because they're uh, closer to what we're doing, and uh, I think it's interesting as well. So this is just a company uh, created by uh, three students from Delft University, so that's a university in, in the Netherlands. So there were students just like you guys. They would be sitting here if I was giving this talk there at the time. And they are, so I think you can really relate to them. This is an interesting example because of that. But the way the, the company was created was that one day there was this guy who was studying at university. He was doing his homework or something. And then he looked at the watch and realized, oh my god, I have to go to basket, basketball practice. And so it, he was late. He was like distracted with work. And uh, so he decided to go, of course, uh, to the practice. But it was really rainy. I don't know if you've been to the Netherlands and if you've experienced the weather there. But there's a lot of rain, I can tell you that. <laughs> and uh, so it was really rainy, and it was very windy. And so he got, got on, he caught his umbrella, and he's, he went to practice. But it was so windy that his umbrella started turning, and it broke. And he was walking uh, with no umbrella in the rain, in the wind, soaking wet, and he was not happy about it. And he, then he was thinking, oh my god, it's like the second or third time this week that I've lost an umbrella. And I'm all wet. What, what the hell? What's it with this umbrella thing? Why don't they make good umbrellas? Why is this such a hard thing to do? And then he thought, why don't I do it? He was a design student. He thought, why don't I just work on it and make a better umbrella? Why did, what could be so hard about it? And so he decided to make it his final uh, course project where he said last year at school, so he did try to design a better umbrella. And he realized that the design of umbrellas, the initial design of the um, most umbrellas that we use today, was actually coming from 3,000 years ago, <laughs> when the Egyptians and the Greeks were trying to protect themselves from the sun. Mm -hmm. So this was like, why? What? There's been not really a great innovation since then. This doesn't make any sense. So he started drawing an umbrella, and he came up with this was not his first one, but you can see this is not <laughs> the normal shape of an umbrella. It's very different. He designed it to be a lot more uh, resistant to wind, and it doesn't turn. 
uh, it, it really is a much more resistant umbrella than you would see if, if it was like the normal shape. So he designed it, he did a great job, but then <laughs> he tried to even get internships in companies to go there and produce for them. They wouldn't buy it. It was like, that's crazy. Everybody knows umbrellas don't look like that. Um, <laughs> they were not interested. And so he decided that he should, start, he, he should do it himself. And he teamed up with a couple, a couple more design uh, students, his colleagues, <coughs> and uh, they started the company to produce this. But you can imagine, again, they didn't really have a lot of money. And uh, what did they do? It's really hard because this is a consumer product. It's not something you can sell to a company. You have to sell to individuals. <coughs> and I think you already know that, but when you try to sell uh, to individuals, you need a lot of brand awareness. And you, it's very, very expensive to get brands, new brands, and new concepts into the consumer's market. That's extremely expensive. And when they ask people what, what to do, they told you, oh, you guys need a ton of money. <laughs> this is really hard. You really need a ton of money. And this is how you do it. You need to do advertising. It's expensive. You need to air TV time, you need a lot of money into this. It's really expensive. Of course, they didn't really have all that money. So they came up with, uh, you know, crazy ideas to try to get to the same uh, objective without really uh, spending all that money. Because if you don't have money, you have to be more creative. And this is what's great about entrepreneurs. They find new ways of doing things. Everybody tell them, tells them, you can't do it. This is impossible. This is not the way to do it. You need a ton of money, but if you're a real entrepreneur, you try to find another way to find to get to there. Uh, and this is what they did. They started by competing in a, uh, awards of, for design, and they started to become uh, well known. They would show up in the news as these guys who won this design award. And then they started uh, realizing that what also made them a weak was a weakness of them was that they were just three kids from our, uh, college, could also be seen as a, a really <coughs> strong advantage. And so they tried to flip it around. And what they did was that they took advantage of the fact that they were just three kids out of college. And they made that their selling point. So they would show up in the news. They were picked up in the news and articles and media, even here in the US, uh, as showing uh, how these three crazy kids uh, had this crazy idea and they were trying to sell umbrellas to the world. And so they were able to get a lot of media exposure and media attention without spending any money, <laughs> actually. So uh, they got a, a lot of awareness out of that. And, and so you will, see, you will see here in the video that they're going to, uh, they managed to get into uh, a lot of TV shows and things like that. And you don't pay for that. It's just it's free, and it's really it works a lot better than if you were paying for advertising. So they went the clever way, and what they did was they managed to find a, a company in China where they would produce it. But of course, it's also hard to have money enough money to order uh, a company in China to produce for you. So what happened was that in the end, the consumers were all, almost like begging for the umbrellas. I want this. <laughs> So they had a list of people who had who wanted the umbrellas but were still waiting. And so these people paid in advance. How brilliant is that? So they paid in advance and they were able to find the, the money to send uh, an order to China and to start producing. And of course, uh, after that, it really started rolling and it, they were they're now a, a quite successful company. And I think you can even buy the umbrellas here in the US. Uh, so I'd like to show you a small video of how of how they let's see if this works.
to me, not their video. This is a video of one of their customers to advertise how or what activities that they do in the, the elderly home. This is playing. examples but the main idea that I really wanted you guys to think about is these guys are people just like you they are uh, they were students they were they didn't have resources they didn't have uh, a lot of experience a lot of knowledge but they were able to start their own ideas and start their things working and they have their dreams uh, their, that they're building so I'd like you guys to also consider this as an option uh, when you graduate and things that you can also do because this is really, uh, I think, I'm not going to tell you it's easy and uh, uh, the best thing to do, but it's, I think it's a lot of fun and I think entrepreneurs are really happy people uh, because they're able to build their dreams. So I think this is, my message would be for you guys to also consider that for your lives. And thank you so much.
Guido, so uh, I have a few minutes for questions. Anyone have any other questions? Or Dr. Buster? There, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned early on that uh, entrepreneurship was fostered here in the U.S. But what if you're from a country where there aren't any intellectual property rights to go ahead and protect your, your ideas? Where's the incentive to, to be an entrepreneur there? Yeah, of course, if, you, if, the, if it's a situation where there's no uh, protection of IP, and if you want to do something in that area, it is complicated. And I'm not sure I would advise you to do that a lot, because it's really, it's complicated. Uh, so what I think, it, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that you cannot do anything still. And uh, a lot of things that are, uh, it really depends on the, on the concept that you really want to introduce. If it's, for example, a lot of companies these days, and in some industries, they will, for example, decide to patent. But other companies or other industries, they prefer to just keep it a secret if it's possible. And not, uh, it's not the only option that you have. So, for example, uh, you know, the, the most famous example is Coca-Cola. They don't have, they don't publish, they don't patent their idea. They just keep it a secret. And so there are other ways that you can go about it. And I think you need, of course, to consider the, the place that you're going into. And of course, you really need to understand it well and be aware of those problems and so not to fall in those traps. So if you are going into a place where you're introducing a new technology and you already know that you're going to be copied immediately, you either don't do it or you find a way to always keep on top of everybody else and then be very, very fast at innovating so that when they are able to copy you, it's no longer relevant. So Okay, um, Dr. Humphrey wants to get a little picture here. Um, 